Well, it's now time to introduce our orator for this evening, Gideon Haig. A journalist of nearly 30 years and a lover of cricket his, cricket his entire life. He is among esteemed company, with past orators being John Howard, Michael Parkinson, Richie Benno, Alan Jones, General Peter Cosgrove, Ricky Ponting, Greg Chappell, Sir Tim Rice, and last year, Rahul Dravid, who spoke so brilliantly. Gideon has contributed to over 100 newspapers and magazines. He's written 26 books, one of which was released today on Warn, an appreciation of The Spin King. Gideon has penned the official history of Cricket Australia and was a script supervisor on this year's hit TV miniseries, How's That? Ladies and gentlemen, Gideon Haig. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I blanched slightly as, um, as you read out those orators. No pressure at all this evening, is there? Uh, thank you, John Bradman. Thank you, Tom and Greta. I need hardly say what an honour it is to have been asked to deliver the 10th Bradman oration. I won't say that it's daunting. That wouldn't be true to the spirit of perhaps the most dauntless cricketer who ever lived, but it is a privilege and an onerous one. Last year, as Sarah reminded us, Rahul Dravid delivered perhaps the best and certainly the most watched of all Bradman orations, a superbly crafted, unbeaten double century of a speech on which I remember thinking at the time it would be very hard to improve. Well, now I find myself coming in after Rahul, a task so enormous that India has traditionally left it to Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, by that marker, I can really only disappoint uh, all I have in common with the little master is that we are both grimly staving off retirement. Although, of course, the potential end of Tendulkar's career is a matter of moment to 1.2 billion Indians, while the potential end of mine concerns only my wife, who would then have to find something for me to do around the house at weekends. Uh, yes, I'm still a cricketer. Um, the game is the longest, continuous, extra-familial thread in my life, and I'm attached to it as tightly as ever. I started pre-season in April. Uh, I own a cat called Trumper. Uh, and while it's hardly uncommon to have a cricket bat in the house, not everyone can claim to have one in the kitchen, one in the living room, one in the bedroom, and one in the outside toilet. Uh, I represented my first club, the St James Presbyterian under 12 Bs, in Geelong when I was nine years old. I played my first game at the Mighty Yarras in 1993 and I'll play my next one this weekend. The rest of my life has been contoured accordingly. I married my wife in, uh, during a Christmas break. We became parents during the next Christmas break. On neither occasion did I miss a training, let alone a game. We delayed our honeymoon until it was more convenient until an Ashes series in England. Anyway, well, I thought it was more convenient. Uh, they do say that the first step to dealing with an addiction is admitting that you have a problem. Okay, well, here's my problem. I'm no bloody good. Uh, oh, I'm not terrible. I mean, you can be terrible in a hilarious and companionable kind of way. Me, I'm just mediocre in a kind of a hanging on for dear life, oh God, let it end soon kind of way. Uh, one of those park cricketers who answers to the designation all rounder because I basically do nothing well and everything equally badly. Uh, that ineptitude, moreover, is now exacerbated by physical decrepitude. Uh, I don't even need to be playing now to be reminded of my age. That was brought home to me a few years ago when the Yarras were joined by a gangling youth whose name was James Harris, following the time-honoured philosophy that the lamest and most obvious nickname usually has the best chance of sticking. I naturally dubbed him Rolf, which I regretted immediately as a look of incomprehension crossed his face. Uh, anyway, I'm hanging in there. Uh, Sir Donald's contemporary Ernie McCormick once said that the moment to retire came when you took off one boot and then the other boot 15 minutes later. Now, I'm stable at around about 10 minutes. Um, but, you know, lack of ability can 
actually adds something to one's cricket experience. When Michael Clarke hits one through the covers, he's simply doing what he and everyone else expects him to do. Me? I'm getting a pleasant surprise. Uh, the top level player inhabits a world of pitiless absolutes. For me, and the likes of me, for we are legion, we're in the realm of the relative, where not so bad is good enough. That's particularly so because of what I might call the compensatory pleasures of cricket. A few seasons ago, I broke the Yarra's games record, um, as I like to put it, a triumph of availability over ability. Uh, <laughs> on doing so, I was forwarded a spreadsheet of all the guys that I'd played with in that time, about 400 of them. Uh, a few brought back no memories at all. That's another function of getting older. But so, so many brought back happy memories of shared struggles, shared gags, moments of joy, moments of disappointment, of relief, of redemption. There were a couple of dickheads in there too. <laughs> no club is without them, I dare say. But the proportion that I've encountered at the Yarras and in cricket in general has been vanishingly small. And well, as we all know, that club dickhead is a dickhead, but he's your dickhead. Um, <laughs> I've always liked a, a remark by Freddie Jakeman, who played for Nottinghamshire in the 1950s. He said, out of every 100 cricketers, there's probably two shits. And if the, 98 of it, if the 98 of us can't look after those two, we're a poor bunch. I'm sure you understand what I mean. The club. We all have at least one. We might not see it much anymore, but it's like a first love. Never forgotten. As a junior cricketer, I took for granted always that there would be a game for me at the weekend. As a senior, the most rewarding parts of cricket have been keeping the show going at a club that's mainly had moths in its trophy cabinet and IOUs in its till. For grassroots cricket in the, in the twenties, I can assure you, is as precarious as it ever was. It's actually not so long ago at the era since we had a $3,500 utilities bill turn up when we had $50 in the bank. Could we, wondered the president, become the first club in history to operate without electricity? <laughs> really, added the treasurer, the most profitable option would simply be to play no games at all and simply to hold barbecues. The secretary rather liked the sound of this, having himself been unanimously elected at the annual meeting while on his honeymoon in Bali still trying to evolve an exit strategy. Alas, for him anyway, we dug deep and found a way, which you tend to over time. Clubs draw on a host of resources. They're dependent on the goodwill of sponsors who ask for little, offer much, and deserve whatever exposure you can give them. And I think that everyone gains from knowing that the friendly staff at the Windsor Community Bank can assist you with all your financial needs that the calamari at the Union Hotel in Chapel Street is delicious, <laughs> that Lachlan Fisher at Fisher Cricket Baton Willow is a prince among men, and that Floss Florum is not only tops for flowers, but lent us their van so that we could retrieve our new bowling mats. When you're personally in charge of your club sponsorships, you do have to be a little bit shameless, don't you think? Um, clubs are likewise dependent on the good offices of their local council. Sometimes these remind me of an old gag. How many council recreation officers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, none, because it's no longer their job to change light bulbs. There's an independent contractor for that. But his tender was so low that if you'll, you'll get a candle only if you ask very nicely. Actually, that's not an old gag. I made it up. But it sounds like it resonates with a few people. Mainly, of course, clubs are dependent on people and it's often where you find those people at their best. They're putting other people's interests first and giving the gift of time in which we generally these days found ourselves so poor. I find the generosity of people towards their fellow man and woman through the medium of cricket deeply moving and motivating. And behind the apparently ordinary individuals who volunteer their aid to the cause of sport, furthermore, unsuspected gifts can also lie. I like that story that Tony Gregg tells about arriving in Adelaide for the rest of the world tour in 1971 and being met at the airport by this dowdy, bespectacled old chap who betook us some 
local association gopher there to carry his bag. And they had a bit of a chat. The old codger did seem to know one of the thing or two about cricket. Play some cricket, did you, old man? Greggy asked. Oh, you know, a bit, said the old bloke. Just then Gary Sobers arrived and headed straight towards Greggy's companion. Hello, Sir Donald, he said. <laughs> Sir, Sir Donald's epic career, in fact, was bookended by administrative roles. Some of you will know that his first job at the Bowral Cricket Club was as the first team scorer. I dare say that unlike ours, his books actually added up. He was picked for his first game as a 12-year-old in the time-honoured tradition when the 11 was short. When Sir Donald's playing day was done, the master of the game became its foremost servant. While everyone revels in 6,996 and 99.94, and we were never going to get through the evening without an invocation of those totemic numbers, a stat I love is that he also attended for nothing 1,713 meetings of the South Australian Cricket Association. I also love the fact that someone bothered to make that into a statistic. <laughs> we inhabit a modern world in which vast and minute attention falls on a very thin layer of highly paid, wildly promoted and hugely glamorised elite athletes who regard the attribute of professionalism as the highest praise. I mean, everyone wants to be a professional nowadays, to do a professional job, to obtain professional standards, to produce work of a professional quality, to exhibit professional pride. Uh, the porn star, Randy Spears, has explained that he manages to work up some lust for 30% of the women that he has sex with in X-rated films. The rest of the time, he is, quote, just being a professional. And yet, even now, amateurism endures, and mightily so. About a quarter of Australians participate in a sport organised by a club, association or organisation each year. What proportion are paid for it, do you think? Probably closer to 0.1% than 1%. Club cricket remains our game's biggest participation sector, with 3,820 clubs in 570 associations enumerated in the most recent cricket census. And I suspect that there's something about battling through and totally arsing everything, just scraping teams together and barely making books balance that becomes part of the pageant. You're aiming to keep petrol in the roller, beer in the fridge and change in the till. But you're maintaining a preparedness to laugh when, due to a communication breakdown, it ends up that there's change in the fridge, the till's full of petrol and the roller is full of beer. We'd like our clubs to be successful, of course, but maybe not so successful that they become big, rich, complex, impersonal. That might become a little bit too much like everyday life, from which when we take the cricket field on the weekend, we're usually seeking some distance. There's an interesting contrast, I fancy, between those groups that we form for ourselves, for our own enjoyment and beneficiation, and those formed for us, for maximum economic efficiency. The modern corporate world has developed to a fine art, the act of building empires of strangers. For our own parts, we seem to prefer environments where it remains possible to know everyone's name, where we're connected by the intangibles of friendship and mutual reciprocity, rather than by the formality of titles, ranks, reporting lines and organisational matrices. I'd go further. This is something Australians have historically been good at. The theory and practice of forming cricket clubs is in our blood and in our history. Within two years of this city's settlement, citizens had founded the Melbourne Cricket Club, dedicated by one of its founders to men of all classes, the plebeian mingling with the peer in respectful feeling and good fellowship a character that it's arguable that it has maintained, assuming that you can wait 20 years to find out. <laughs> Melbourne's first significant rival was the Brighton Cricket Club, still prospering, 170 years young. Tasmania's oldest surviving clubs date from around about the same time. South Australia's oldest surviving clubs from about a century and a half ago. 
They're older, therefore, than a majority of Australia's legislatures, an overwhelming number of our municipalities, and all but a tiny handful of our commercial enterprises. The overwhelming portion of clubs, of course, do not endure anywhere near so long. They rise and fall because of geography, demography, the availability of participants, the accessibility of organisers, facilities and funds. But the habits that they instil are those that build communities of giving and sharing, of volunteering and responding, of balancing interests, nurturing culture, respecting history and generally joining in common purpose. Grassroots cricket can even, I fancy, claim an influence on the foundation of the, cricket, of the Australian Commonwealth. Cricket has always taken a certain pride in having provided an inspiriting example to the inchoate nation, the idea of a unified Australian team preempting that of a unified Australia. But there's more to this. When you focus on the political actors in the period around Federation, it's striking how varied and how deep were their cricket connections. Four key figures in Federation, George Reid, Edmund Barton, Charles Kingston and Thomas Playford, also served as at least vice presidents of the cricket associations in their respective states. Whilst he was a 22-year-old assistant accountant in the colonial treasury, George Reid was elected delegate to the New South Wales Cricket Association for the Warwick Cricket Club, the same club, incidentally, as Dave Gregory, Australia's first captain. After nine years, Reid became association treasurer and he continued serving as association president whilst he was Premier of New South Wales, resigning only in the year before he became Prime Minister. Reid was not himself a noted player, although he might have made a handy sight screen, being roughly as wide as he was tall, and he certainly sledged like an Australian cricketer. Once, while addressing an audience at, from a hotel balcony in Newcastle, he nonchalantly propped his belly on the balustrade. What'll you name it, George? called a heckler. Reid replied, if it's all piss and wind as I expect, I'll name it after you, young fella. <laughs> Consult the New South Wales Cricket Association annual reports in Reid's time and you'll find three future premiers, James McGowan, Joseph Carruthers and John Storey, acting as delegates for their clubs, Redfern, University and Balmain respectively. Carruthers and Storey, interestingly, were born rivals. Carruthers was a hotshot lawyer and a rock-ribbed conservative. Storey was a state school educated boilermaker and a self-described evolutionary socialist. What made them unlikely lifelong friends was representing the same parliamentary 11. As Carruthers wrote in his memoirs, there were other men of different shades of political belief in the cricket team and I can say of them, as I say of Storey and myself, that the bitterness of party strife disappeared during contact with one another in the cricket field. In this city, around the turn of the century, the presidents of the St Kilda, East Melbourne, Richmond and Paran cricket clubs were respectively also Australia's first treasurer, Sir George Turner, Melbourne's first federal member, Sir Malcolm McKechn, and the local members for their suburbs, George Bennett and Donald McKinnon. Again, cricket exerted a surprisingly broad appeal Turner was a stolid bookkeeper, McKechn a bold entrepreneur, Bennett a radical Catholic from Banffshire who championed the eight hour day, and McKinnon a silver haired Presbyterian educated in classics at Oxford, later to become president of the Victorian Cricket Association and Australia's wartime director general of recruiting. Admittedly, the era's foremost political figure, Alfred Deakin, professed no great love for cricket, but when he wanted to describe Australian politics in the era of its split between Labor, free traders and protectionists, Deakin deployed a famous cricket metaphor. It was, he said, like a cricket match featuring three 11s, an idea so outlandish that it hasn't even occurred to Mike McKenna yet. <laughs> in Deakin's ministry, meanwhile, was a Queenslander rejoicing in the name Colonel Justin Fox Greenlaw Foxton, who in cricket rose highest of all, becoming chairman of the Australian Board of Control after nearly 30 years in local and federal politics. While researching this oration, I unearthed uh, reports of the Athenian Cricket Club, which Foxton helped to found in Ipswich in the 1860s when he was a teenaged article clerk. Now, there obviously wasn't a lot happening in Queensland 150 years ago because 
Brisbane's Courier gave extensive coverage to the Athenians' inaugural annual meeting held in Ipswich's Church of England sh schoolroom in March 1867, where Foxton, then just 17, presented the accounts, which were deemed most satisfactory. The Courier's report continued, there has been a decided improvement in the play in the last 12 months, both on account of the accession of new members and the natural result of practice. It is to be regretted that practice is not more numerously attended. The ground has not been in good order, and this has rendered play unsteady. Now, Colonel Justin Fox Greenlaw Foxton would not have recognised what cricket has become today, but he would have been right at home at the Yarra's committee meeting that I attended last week. <laughs> Grounds a bit rough? Tick. Attendance at trainings a bit spotty? Tick. Unsteady play? Big tick. <laughs> Otherwise, ticking over? Well. Cricket and politics have never interpenetrated in this country as deeply as in others, thankfully so. But there is something significant, I think, about club cricket having loomed so large in the lives of so many involved in the early fashioning of this young nation. In order that everyone bats, bowls and fields in club cricket, some must get organised. They must elect officials, they must hold meetings, they must weigh interests, they must manage finances, they must delegate responsibilities. And these are skills readily transferable to other fields. We can couch this more generally too. For numberless millions of Australians, a sports club has been the original and most tangible experience of day-to-day -day democracy and their greatest means of investment in civic amenity. The historian John Hurst has called Australia a democracy of manners. Australia, he observes, is short on inspirational rhetoric where democracy is concerned. Our constitution is silent on citizenship. Our curricula has no great tradition of civic education. What we have instead, says Hurst, is a way that Australians blot out differences when people meet face to face and talk to each other as if they are equals. In no environment, I think, has this tended to happen more spontaneously than when individuals band together in pursuit of a common sporting goal. Club sport remains, I would argue, the most inclusive, evolved and constructive means by which Australians express their instinct to associate. Better yet, our clubs are distinguished to this day by actually working. In our daily lives, we are regularly beset by institutions that leave us feeling powerless, helpless, voiceless. Government institutions, commercial institutions, financial institutions, religious institutions, media institutions. It's easy to think, what does it matter what I do? What influence can I possibly have? At the little sporting institutions that we make for ourselves, we aren't powerless. We can and do make a difference. We can put a shoulder to the wheel and feel the thing move. It's a sorry reflection on the times that so few outside an immediate circle seem to grasp that. As if the thrall of the television remote and the atomization of the working week were not enough, community sport has suffered gravely from a climate of financial stringency and sterile user pays philosophies. But we subsidize sporting clubs in our community, claim local governments, oblivious to the way that sporting clubs subsidize local governments by mobilising free labour and local expertise, contributing to social cohesion and civic texture. In fact, the minuscule funding support that local sport receives has colossal multiplier effects. And if this can't be readily ascertained by economic models, then the answer is new models, because the old ones aren't working anymore. But I can't hold local governments wholly responsible. I also fear that from time to time, a mechanistic view of grassroots cricket prevails from within cricket itself. It's regarded simply as a kind of squeaky and unpainted front gate to one of those glorious pathways that one hears so much of. Ah, the pathway, paved with gold and strewn with primrose petals. New markets is the clarion call today. But what of the old? 
All we've got to recommend us is that we love the game and we wonder from time to time whether the game still loves us. Some of you would have seen the recent figures of the Australian cricket census, which were touted as showing cricket to be the country's biggest participation sport. At the same time, as it disclosed, a 3.5% decline in our club cricket population. Now, we don't have the advantage of exit interviews, but I wonder how many of those individuals passed out of the game because they don't like the way it is run and promoted and headed. I don't wish to spread alarm, but this would not wish to be remembered as the cricket generation that grew so obsessed with flogging KFC and accumulating Facebook likes that it let its core constituencies fade away. Tomorrow, uh, an annual meeting of Cricket Australia will finally phase out the system by which it has been governed since 1905, under which its board has been composed of the nominees of state associations drawn from the delegates of their premier district and grade clubs. It's a system that has had a lot of critics, me among them, and I'm not about to mourn its passing. But it has always exhibited one particular cardinal virtue, that of recognising the integral role of the club in the cricket of this country and the value of the volunteer in a sporting economy that could not otherwise function. And it would be remiss of cricket if it simply marched into its corporatist future without a backward glance or a sideways acknowledgement of cricket's hardiest faithful. In that spirit, I'd like to close this speech the old-fashioned way by proposing a toast to the club. It's the beginning of all of us, to your club, for all that it's done for you, to all that you have done and might yet do for it. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the club. The club. Glad to hear it. That's me done, folks.